Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. As the Biden administration defends its withdrawal from Afghanistan and the fallout from the Taliban takeover, I'm joined now by two veteran U.S. service members who have long been warning that the war in Afghanistan was doomed and immoral. Danny Sherson is a retired U.S. Army officer, senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. He served combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and later taught history at this point. His latest book is A True History of the United States. And Matthew Ho is a former Marine and State Department official who resigned in protest from his post in Afghanistan over U.S. policy in September 2009. He is now a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Danny and Matthew, welcome to Pushback. Thanks so much for having me. So, Matt, let me start with you. You resigned from your job uh, serving in Afghanistan for the State Department over the failed strategy, over the uh, plans for the surge. What is your response now to the U.S. finally withdrawal, uh, finally withdrawing and this quick Taliban takeover? Well, this is what defeat looks like. You know, if you choose uh, for 20 years in Afghanistan and even longer than that, I mean, there are lots of historical precedents with uh, the Afghan war, with the United States helped instigate and sustained and repelled, you know, starting in 1979, um, uh, you know, as well as other wars. Uh, but the idea, though, about over, particularly over the last 20 years in Afghanistan, the United States has simply chosen military victory as the outcome in the war. Uh, the idea of defeating the Taliban militarily um, and forcing them to negotiate on basically surrender terms has been the United States policy from 2001 up until uh, the fall of 2018 when Donald Trump begins negotiations with the Taliban, which were done strictly for Donald Trump's own ego and own political uh, uh, necessities. Uh, so this is what this is what defeat looks like when you choose that strategy and have no other uh, provide no other options, uh, choose no other paths, uh, just hammer, just think you're going to win militarily. This is what losing looks like. And so it was inevitable as long as the United States chose that strategy. Um, but it was not inevitable because there were other options. I mean, certainly the commentary uh, that is being discussed right now um, it, throughout the media is, is very misleading. It, it, it's mendacious. Uh, it's foolish. Uh, it's being sprouted. It's being spouted by uh, uh, former generals, officials, think tankers, journalists who have been wrong the entire time about this war, demonstrably wrong. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there are other options. I mean, they, they invading and occupying a nation uh, because you were attacked by an organization that had between 200 and 400 people worldwide, which is the strength of Al-Qaeda on 9-11, 200 to 400 people worldwide, invading and occupying a nation, jumping into the middle of a civil war um, and then demanding military victory. Um, that outcome was always going to be inevitable. But there were many other options that the United States could have chosen to follow or, 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 or pursue uh, throughout these 20 years. Danny, when you were serving in Afghanistan, what did you observe about what U.S. leaders, military officials were saying publicly about the war and its progress and what the reality actually was? Well, the mismatch between rhetoric, which was always sort of whimsical and optimistic, uh, it was built on buzzwords. Uh, there was always light around the corner. I mean, it was a platitude factory. Uh, in 2011 and 12 in Kandahar province, which is where I served as a troop commander, uh, re really right down in the Taliban's heartland, just miles away from where Mullah Omar, you know, kind of founded the gang uh, back in 94. You know, the Washington Post releases the Afghanistan papers in like 2019. And, you know, I think Matt and I were both writing articles about this. You know, this is the Pentagon Papers for our generation, uh, yada, yada, yada. But the thing that didn't, it didn't surprise me because the lived experience on the ground is that I was told by the media when I would put on the national news or, you know, put on CNN.com that the surge is working, that the fact that we put 100,000 soldiers there, and we're really doubling down that, that now we've got it. The Taliban's being pushed back. I kept hearing this, but then I was wondering why uh, sometimes my soldiers and one time I had to dive into a canal within feet of the exit of our little outpost in Kandahar province, which I'd been told was like the key battleground. Of course, in the end, we were attacked 365 out of 365 days, my troop was. Uh, and the Taliban, at best, we fought each other to a standstill. And I'll tell you, I just 
right away, I knew that the generals who would come visit me and tell me about all the great progress, despite what I showed them uh, and the stuff that I saw in the national news, I was neither surprised by the Washington Post's release showing that the generals and the politicians had lied about this to the public, nor was I completely surprised, as Matt said, that this was the outcome. But the Taliban emerged essentially victorious. The speed and the scale, you know, some of that was a little surprising, but I'd often said that this thing could pick up a momentum of its own because this could turn on morale and psychological factors. And it seems that it did. Matt, you interacted with some of the most senior people in the U.S. government when it comes to Afghanistan policy. What was the gap between what they acknowledged to you privately as you voiced your concerns when you came out publicly resigning as the first State Department official to do so, to resign in protest over the Afghanistan war? What was the gap between what they acknowledged to you privately and what they said in public? I'm thinking of people like Richard Holbrook, uh, later on Chuck Hagel, who went on to become Obama's defense secretary. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It was um, um, there was a massive uh, uh, dissonance between what they would say privately and what they would do publicly, uh, particularly when it came down to them having to make decisions about their careers and not just with officials, but also members of Congress. I can tell you plenty of stories where senior members of Congress, men who are on the House and Armed Services Committee would agree with me in private and then say something completely opposite, you know. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, Richard Holbrook, who was the senior, uh, who was uh, Obama's uh, representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, you know, he said to me, I agree with 95% of what you said. Uh, G uh, Carl Eikenberry, who was the ambassador of Afghanistan when I was resigning, he said, I completely agree with your reasons. And if you stay and keep working for me, I will write the introduction to your resignation letter when you leave. I mean, things like this, the deputy ambassador, uh, uh, Richard Doni in, in, in Kabul for the United States, he said, I've got two uh, military age kids. There is no way I would allow them to be uh, no way I would allow them to fight in this war. I mean, and, and on and on and on stories like that over and over everywhere you went. My, my counterparts, um, when I resigned and sent that letter, um, it went to I sent it to my political officer counterparts in the other violent in, in the other five or six most violent provinces in Afghanistan, which were Kandahar, Helmand at that part, like Nangahar, Kunar, Nuristan. And the responses I got back were absolutely, you know, I remember one, one, one of my counterparts from Kandahar said, I'd do exactly what you were doing if I didn't have two kids getting ready to go to college. I mean, so you had a lot of that. And then you have you with the members of Congress, our political leaders, St. Patrick's Day 2010, I go in to see Ike Skelton, who at that time was the chair of the House Armed Services Committee, the person responsible for oversight of the armed forces for the United States of America. And Skelton says to me, again, eight and a half years after the United States invaded Afghanistan. I have never had a negative briefing on Afghanistan before now. Eight wow. and a half years, right? I mean, like, and I can tell you later that year or the following year, met with Adam Smith, one of two top Democrats on the House Armed Services Committee, says to me and a couple other people, I know the generals come in here and lie about it. There's nothing I feel I can do about it. Same with Jack Reed, met Jack Reed, one of two top uh, Democrats on the Senate Armed Services Committee, spent an hour with Jack Reed, very gracious to me. As we're walking out, his senior advisor for foreign policy and military affairs, she says to me, um, excuse me, we know there is a dissonance between what the generals are saying publicly and what the reality is on the ground in Afghanistan. But we don't feel it's our place to get in the middle of that. Right. Jack Reed, who is now the uh, uh, you know, I believe I, I, I can't keep up with these things sometimes, but I believe he is the chair of the Senate Armed Service Committee now. And at that point, he was either the. Um, uh, ranking member or the, the second Democrat uh, on, on, a, on a Senate Armed Services Committee saying, we don't think it's our place to get in between. Um, and I could go on here all day with you, Aaron, telling you things like this, whether it be from people at Danny and I's level, all the way to the most senior levels of the United States government, both elected and, uh, and unelected uh, officials who just went along with it because that was in their best interests. And Matt, briefly, uh, for people who aren't familiar with your story, what were your key concerns that prompted you to resign from the State Department while serving in Afghanistan? Uh, you know, the, the main thing was getting to Afghanistan after being in Iraq, uh, the Iraq war twice and seeing that there was no fundamental difference between the wars, um, that these wars were being pursued for uh, basically the glory of the presidency. Uh, and this is not just my my opinion on it. This is what the Washington Post Afghan papers uh, that were released in December 2019 that documented systemic lying 
of all levels through all presidential administrations with regards to the Afghan war. The Washington Post comes to the conclusion that this war was based on the pursuit of domestic political objectives. Uh, I mean, so that that's what I saw, why there was no difference between Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and then uh, I, at that point, after being in war twice, I was morally and intellectually broken, um, kept making excuses for myself, rationalization, lies. You know, we can go through that whole, uh, you know, how how over time your rationalizations are defeated by what you are experiencing. So then you come up with a new rationalization. Right. You know, um, but. Yeah. After being, you know, so being there five months, seeing the same thing as I saw in Iraq, seeing that the war is no fundamentally different, being morally and intellectually broken. Yeah, that's when I chose to resign because, yeah, exactly. The the, the people we were supporting in Afghanistan, uh, the kleptocracy, the warlords, the drug lords we had in power who were just as terrible in the Taliban as many ways, but just a different form of terrible. Right. It, you know, I mean, basically, we, we replaced a theocratic repressive government with a kleptocratic repressive government. Um, but also, too, seeing that everywhere, uh, understanding, I should say, that the majority of the foot soldiers of the Taliban and much of the Taliban leadership were fighting us because we were occupying them and because we had interceded in the midst of a civil war. So, yeah, I, I, so that's when in September 2009, I resigned. Danny, let me ask you about the racket that was uh, run in Afghanistan. The uh, the common talking point is that, you know, we shouldn't be nation building. We shouldn't be trying to fix another nation, but that's not what was happening. Afghanistan was being used billions of dollars back to U.S. defense contractors. In foreign policy, uh, there was a recent article that says this, much of the U.S. investment did not stay in Afghanistan because of heavy reliance on a complex ecosystem of defense contractors, Washington banditry, and aid contractors, between 80 and 90% of outlays actually returned to the U.S. economy. <laughs> of the 10 to 20% of the contracts that remained in the country, the U.S. rarely cared about the efficacy of the initiative. What did you observe about this, about the reality of you know, these billions of dollars that the U.S. spent in Afghanistan and who it actually benefited? You know, down, down at the troop level, you know, about 100 soldiers that I commanded, uh, I would I was giving out hundreds of thousands of those dollars. Right. So I was in on the scheme just at the lowest level of the Ponzi scheme. Um, we probably should have been stealing and we didn't take a dime. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting about this is, you know, we saw these like no bid or, or one bid contracts. Basically, um, we were trying we were fighting every day, as I said. But we also at one point were paying twelve hundred Afghan people right to line up once a week. We called it payday. I have amazing pictures of it. And we would pay them, you know, to clean canals or to do this or that. Um, one of the ways that I so there's two components. There's number one, the defense contractors, because they're the only people who profited from the war. Right. So three of my soldiers were killed uh, and one lives as a triple amputee. Uh, those soldiers died uh, for thirty to forty thousand dollars a year, give or take, given their rank. Um, and I think it is rather obscene. Uh, that, you know, we'll adulate those soldiers a little, right? Just publicly, we, we, we pay lip service, but there's no accountability for people who made millions and billions uh, profiting off these wars. The whole thing rested on a, a complete farce foundation. I mean, if you bring it up a few levels, the Afghan government never even had the tax revenue necessary to pay its own police, its, its own soldiers. It, it just didn't have the money. And so it, no one ever explained to me how we were going to fix that. I didn't think there was any sort of major stimulus to, you know, grow the Afghan economy down at the local level. I was giving this money out. And the second component is the Taliban was was making money off it. I knew full well that the people that I appointed as foremen to you know watch them pretend to work and then I would actually pay them. Uh, I knew they were kicking back to the Taliban. How did I know that? A 1,200 person line or even when it jumped down to like a four or 500 person line. This took all day, by the way, to pay them because we had to do paperwork and everything and sign their names, but they don't write. So there was sometimes they draw a picture or whatever, but they would scribble something. And the Taliban never once killed any of them. I mean, I told you they, they would attack our towers of the of the base every day and they never attacked him. I tried to tell my colonel that I said, um, you know, I think the Taliban's profiting from this because they would not just let this go. Right. Because they're collaborating with us. They say they're not supposed to do that. But, you know, they never attack it, sir. And he was like, listen, the brigade commander likes the cash for work stats. You've got the best cash for work program going in the battalion, maybe in the brigade. This is a big Good news story for you. And you know what? Sure enough, I fought the Taliban to a standstill at best. And I got a glowing officer evaluation report. I mean, I was a loser, right? I, I, at best, a draw. 
And but if you read my report, and those are the brother captains next to me and my colonel for sure, you would think I single handedly, my troop won that war. And it was such an absurdity. And that's what Matt's kind of talking about. It's like everybody passed the buck. Everybody knows, kind of winks, moves on with their career. But what happened is we bet big, we lost big. Uh, and the Taliban called in the chips. The, you know, and it, you almost, I, I can't stand most of what some, you know, the more extreme elements of the Taliban stand for because they're not a monolith. But you got to almost respect the, the move. I mean, it, it really does expose this sandcastle. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit hard to take emotionally. I think a lot of us have been checking on each other and, and sort of the veteran community, especially those of us who speak out. But uh, on some level, just like I respected my mirror, the Taliban captain, right, whatever he was, I never found out his actual name. He fought me to a standstill despite all my drones and, you know, flat screen TVs and artillery. I, the same way I sort of respect him, you, I almost respect the way the Taliban exposed this, not because I wanted them to win. But it's just an, it, it's a really fascinating element to this. You know, Aaron, if I could bring something to, 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 to co in with this. Danny had spoke earlier about how um, – we had slogans, we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like Orwellian uh, double speak to go along with this war, like things that promote uh, uh, triumphant sayings and, and, and things that just weren't true, right? The opposite side, the, the, the corollary to that was that there were things we were not allowed to say. If Danny could never say what he just said about respect for his opponent, for his adversary. Absolutely not. That was absolutely forbidden. There was a level of racism that was involved here, like by the fact that us, you know, this white empire in this brown savage country, there was a bit of that. Uh, but also, too, there was the fear of upsetting senior leaders. Uh, I mean, I think it's impossible to talk about the Afghan war without talking about the Iraq war and then by extension, the entire war of the United States in the Muslim world. Um, you know, and some of the things that Danny spoke about in terms of like giving out the money, my exact same experience. I, I used to pay out in my time in Iraq in 04 and 05 between $250,000 and $3 million a week. Never once did I hear at same time, you know, one o'clock on Friday every week, right? Center up to Crete. Never once did I hear of somebody getting robbed, let alone killed, right? And I used to walk out with hundreds of thousands of dollars in plastic shopping bags, you know, but the idea that up until some point in either late 04 or 05, we were forbidden to use the term insurgency. That was a dirty word. God forbid if it got up to Wolfowitz or Rumsfeld that some commander in Iraq was speaking of what was happening as anything other than dead enders or terrorists. So how, how can you think you are actually going to win a war if you cannot even define it properly? Uh, you know, I mean, so I, I think that's something that people have to realize is that, you know, there, there was this positive spin, but then there was also a very real clampdown of any intellectual or moral honesty in these wars. And so the outcome, how could this outcome be any different? And when you talk about the connection between the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, I wonder if uh, that extends to basically the this strategy inside the Bush administration to refuse to end the Afghan war when it had the chance, when it rejected Taliban offers, when it could have uh, finished off bin Laden, but basically let him escape. And what I've heard people like Scott Horton say, who's written extensively on Afghanistan, is that they, the Bush administration didn't want to end the Afghan war because that would have given the impression that the war on terror was won. And that wouldn't, that would have impeded their ability to then take the war on terror to Iraq. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If people are not familiar with Scott Horton, his two books, uh, Fool's Errand and Enough Already, are two of the best books about these wars. That, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about that. That, that. That's all that needs to be said about Scott and his work. He is he is one of the best people we have in this country on, on the wars. Um, you know, and yeah, the three of you, by the way, the three of your vo voices like yours have been completely ignored mm -hmm. for, for for so many years now. And it's that's why it's like there's uh, compounding the tragedy is now this this effort uh, this this um, these displays of shock and horror at what is happening in Afghanistan is if this wasn't entirely foreseeable and called out by people like you guys for so long now. Well, yeah, no, I, I think you know you have to understand how the entire American empire works. And your point being that ending the war in Afghanistan would not have allowed the war on terror to go forward, particularly the war you say in Iraq. Uh, the invasion of Iraq. And then, of course, you have to remember that how the Obama administration further expands the war through, again, throughout the Muslim world, from the West Coast of Africa all the way to Pakistan, 
one giant world war run by the United States. Um, I, I think you have to, again, understanding who populated the White House, the State Department, the Defense Department at during the Bush administration. These were the neoconservatives who come out of Chicago school. They are not just uh, stalwarts of the empire. They believe very much in the expansion of the empire for neoliberal purposes, as well as for American exceptionalism purposes. These, they're very different uh, uh, defenders of empire than, say, the men that Trump brought in, the McMasters, the Mattises, the uh, Kellys, who believe in empire, but they believe these are frontier lands that must just be subjugated. The grass must be cut so to speak, which is a term the CIA and special operations guys use a lot. So what I, I think what you have with, with understanding it, it with the expansion of the empire is that one of the purposes of empire is to, uh, well, maintain the empire, but to extract wealth. And I, I, when you get to this idea, I don't think there's a very, um, there's not a very economic compelling reason for the invasion of Afghanistan. I think that is really about revenge, really about the president's political priorities, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, uh, repairing the humiliation done to the empire. However, I think with Iraq and other parts, uh, other of these wars, you have a lot of different things that go into it. But with Iraq, you can make a compelling argument on the economic aspects of it because there was extraction that it could come occur could come from Iraq. Um, and to give you an idea, what I mean by extraction and the wealth, um, look, the most wealthy part of the United States since 2001 has been the Washington D.C. suburbs. Depending upon what report you look at, six and six out of nine counties, seven out of ten counties, whatever, are the wealthiest counties in America. Prior to that, it was places like Silicon Valley, you know, uh, coal mining areas, uh, the oil and gas area, the oil areas of Tulsa and Dallas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and just to wrap it up, I was on a podcast with Ryan Grimm of The Intercept yesterday, and I, I brought this point up, and then Ryan said, "You know what?" We have to be fair about all this. And the paraphrase, Ryan, he said, you know, there was a very, recon very successful reconstruction effort during these wars. It just took place in Northern Virginia and Maryland. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm trying to add really quick, I think very fast. It is not an accident that Matt and I were both in Iraq first and then decided to sort of descend after Afghanistan. I think that's not an accident. I mean, not everyone had that path, but sort of seeing the farce and the absurdity and the futility of Iraq and then noticing that like the snake oil of the surge that was going to be applied in Afghanistan was, was a, a, a big break. And then, and then this, which is what gets me in trouble with what's left of my polite liberal friends. <laughs> I a lot of the facts. Remember that, 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 you know, Hugh Shelton, right. Was that who it was who said, uh, or Skelton, Ike Skelton. He said, he's never heard a negative briefing on Afghanistan. Yeah. I blame that largely on Obama. I mean, I blame that on the fact that he decided to make it the good war. Because when he decided to make it the good war and triple the troops in Afghanistan, right? And I supported Obama in a way. I thought he was going to save us. I mean, I was dying in, in Iraq. I mean, emotionally dying. And I was like, this is it. Like, I was on the train, right? Um, when he did that and called it the good war, now the the establishment Democrats and, and even some of the grassroots, you know, they weren't really going to be too critical of the Afghan war. They were focused on Iraq. And then the, the hawks on the right, they were going to be like, well, we don't like Obama. We'll still say he was born in Kenya but we do like war. So suddenly you're not going to get the, only on the fringes. Is there going to be any arguments? So, I mean, I really do blame the complicity uh, and the escalation of Barack Obama for a lot of how long this went on. And someone like Obama, who's a very skilled speaker and has a liberal veneer, he's able to sell escalations like this a lot better to a wider public than someone like, you know, John McCain, who is a Republican uh, war hawk. It's, um, it's, it's uh, that speaks to the dangers of these of these liberal hawks like Obama. Danny, did you did you ever consider the path of just keeping your head down and becoming rich like these other people who live in the D.C. suburbs off of the Afghanistan war? Uh, no, I, I didn't. And that's not because uh, I'm, I'm, I have any sort of heroics like Matt's descent. And he'll hate this. But his descent, I mean, that was real descent. He, he left the job. You know, I, I, I was doing what he was doing up to that point, but for longer, where I kept coming up with new reasons to stay. I, I almost stayed in the military. I mean, I almost tried to make full colonel and who knows, maybe brigadier general. Right. Um, I mean, I could run fairly fast and I can, you know, I can speak well and, and say platitudes if I wanted. Right. And that mean, and, and as long as I don't get out of line, I can go far. Right. I'm a white male in the military. And you know what I mean? Who's reasonably competent. I could do anything. 
Uh, I thought about that and I would always come up with reasons, you know, it was like the good people have to stay, you know, uh, you can't have only the monsters in. you need thinkers. And I was like, wow, I like all those because they're like gold stars. And I've been enjoying that since kindergarten. But I, by the time I was leaving, by the time I publicly dissented and they didn't like it, and then they kind of like offered me medical retirement, which, which I thought was just wonderful. Um, and I, I mean, I needed to go. I never considered it at that point. I, I just seen too much. And what I described about, you know, what my soldiers were making and, and losing and then my own mental health struggles, I really don't think I could have looked at myself in the mirror in the morning. But but I was criminally complicit for uh, almost 18 years. So I don't want to sound like I'm saying that I have some sort of moral code. I mean, that, a lot of what I'm doing now is like a vague version of penance. Uh, and, and, I, and I mean, I, I try to take seriously my own complicity. And I want to say the same thing, too. 12 years for me and, you know, other people. In, you know, we, we, Danny and I work with organizations called Veterans for Peace and About Face, uh, you know, Veterans Against the Wars. Um, and that's what a lot of it is. You, you do. You go through periods where you you, you you make. When I went to Iraq my first time in 04, it was about, well, I know this is all screwed up. But at that time, we know what weapons of mass destruction was a lie, et cetera. But I can make a difference. Right. And then when you see that's complete bullshit, you, may, you, you tell yourself, well, what if I stay in long enough? Then I'll be a senior person and I can make a difference there. And then that's bullshit. And then it's like, well, I can take the care of the people around me and make because I'm a good officer. I can make sure they come home. Right. Because these other guys suck and they're going to get people killed. You know, and so you just continually evolve, evolve your rationales and your reasons until you finally hit that point where you can't go on any longer. Um, and, and so it is. But I, I think Danny's point that most of us are doing this as a, a mean of repent, means of repentance of atonement, uh, you know, of trying to look, we, 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 we made a very serious mistake. We were complicit and we have vowed to live our lives differently. Let's talk uh, history a little bit. How did the Taliban go from being overthrown very quickly in the first months of the war to, you know, defeated for the first few years, it looks like, uh, unless I'm wrong, to now being back in power? How did, the, how did this happen? Well, I mean, I, I can start, but Matt, you, I think you have a lot on the early part. But I mean, first of all, they weren't they weren't exactly defeated, but they probably could have been uh, or at least negotiated into defeat. I mean, even when when the Northern Alliance, which we essentially rented, right, we, we they, they were rent a warlords, right? You know, rent a, a war criminals, in fact, in many cases, when they start going down to Kandahar with their special forces advisors, you know, one of whom uh, one of the famous ones was my professor later at West Point. Um, they get down there and the Taliban is, you know, offering some sort of deal. They're saying, like, if we let Mullah Omar live in some sort of protected custody, um, you know, maybe we could work something out. Supposedly even Karzai was thinking about it. And, and Rumsfeld, for example, was having none of it. Um, the Bush administration. Was having none of it. And that's what Matt's talking about. There were all these different times and there was stuff before that. And then there was stuff after. But by not doing that, what was left of the Taliban went to Pakistan. And of course, uh, then they go into a bit of remission and rebuilding. Now, there's one narrative I don't like a whole lot, and it goes like this, and you'll see it in the Washington Post and the New York Times every day. The real problem is Bush, because Bush focused on Iraq. That is a problem, maybe the worst American decision in foreign policy. If not ever, it's up there, right? It's top three. It's like with Casablanca in the top movies. Like, it's always on the list. <laughs> but that's not the problem. That's not why the Taliban won, per se, right? The idea that if we would have just only focused there... The, the problem was one that we never recognized this. And it's a very simple, we're talking history. Counterinsurgency doesn't work. Almost never. Almost a statistically irrelevant number of times does it work. And only when the conditions are perfect, yep. do they work. And the, and the insurgents are incompetent. Because here's the real deal. The problem was the militarized policy. The problem was the occupation. So long as the United States was a military occupier that was seen as propping up a government that was then seen as the lackeys of the United States, people don't like being occupied. And the Taliban then, even when it was just remnants and they were kind of rebuilding and coming back and then eventually start coming across the border, light attacks, casualties were still low for Americans in 04 and 05. They, we bolster their narrative and we kind of made the Taliban. And we, we, we sort of, what we ended up doing by our very presence was forming them into the national resistance organization they always wanted to be. I mean, they essentially became the only game in town for, for the I'm a real I'm a real Afghan. Right. I'm a nationalist Afghan. Those people in Kabul, they're working with the Americans. And we never got that. And we thought that, well, more militarization will fix the problem of militarization being the problem. And that's the kind of circular logic that we had. Um, so I think that, you know, over time, 
the Taliban was able to get strong enough that they can get us into a stalemate and then wait out the inevitability that the United States can't maintain this forever, not at those levels. And Danny, if you can give us an example that you saw of how U.S. policy pushed Afghans into the arms of the Taliban, people who might not necessarily have been political, but just because of U.S. policy, they supported the insurgency. There's a couple of easy ones, airstrikes that I dropped that hit the wrong people. That, that I don't like that. Um, raids that were done in my sector by Rangers and Navy SEALs without even informing me until minutes before or sometimes after that hit the wrong house. And then I had to clean up the mess. Of course, they leave and go back to their main, main base. I'm not just blaming the Special Forces folks. I mean, the intel was bad. We didn't know what we were doing. We lacked human informants because down at least where I was, they wouldn't they wouldn't dare tell us anything. Uh, I never, I never once, this is instructive. I'm a little bit off. I'll, I'll go back to that. But do you know that I never once received a tip from a, an Afghan villager that led me to a cache of Taliban arms or to a staging area? I told you they attacked us every day. I wish I could have figured out where they were staging and like getting their stuff together because we would have wiped them out. My soldiers were pretty good at what they did. They just were fighting a hopeless war. Um, that never happened because the people never really flipped to our side. The reasons are those errant airstrikes. How about our drug policy? We kept changing whether we were going to burn. In my tour, three times, I was given three countermanding orders. Uh, I can't remember the order, but it was either we burn all the poppy we see. Uh, no, let them keep it because, you know, that's their livelihood. And like the Taliban comes in and expects the money. It might hurt them. And then no, burn it again. And it, it was absurd. So I literally have pictures on my computer right now. I could show you from different months. Uh, one of them is like a burning like inferno. OK, of, of Poppy. And then the next one is my lieutenants like like laying in the field and, and making jokes. But doing things like taking away their economic livelihoods, um, you know, through these co constantly changing policies. Uh, and I'll say the last one probably was our allies, our allies, not, not because everyone in the Afghan security forces was awful, but, uh, but they were outsiders, largely. M most of them in my area from the north. Some of them didn't even speak Pashto. I told my, my colonel didn't know this like eight months in and a visiting one star general from RC South, which was in charge of the entire southern part of the country where they all speak Pashto, was surprised when I explained to him that I'm having trouble because the, my allied Afghan soldiers were most from the north are seen as, as almost as much outsiders as me. And sometimes they were pretty brutal. So that also turned a lot of the people towards the Taliban. By the way, the fact that the, a general didn't know that proves my point that if, you know, if you could smile, run fast and stay in line, like apparently you don't have to know about the country that you're in charge of, uh, you know, occupying and stabilizing. Yeah. I mean, that point about um, that, the forces that we created in Afghanistan, this is the same thing that happened in Iraq with, with the, the Shias and Sunnis. Uh, we created internal occupation forces, the Shia forces and Sunnis, uh, the Shia forces that were in the Sunni areas in Iraq and in, in, in 03, 04, 05, 06 into 07, um, they were seen as external occupiers. And it, it, what I always tell people about, which is, seems it's crazy, uh, you know, because of how bad the American occupation of Iraq was, how terrible and criminal and brutal it was. The fact was that in Anbar province, the second deadliest province in, in Iraq outside of Baghdad, um, American Marines would be welcomed into Sunni homes much quicker than Iraqi army and Iraqi police units would be. I mean, because we are pursuing a divide and conquer strategy in both countries. Um, and we saw the results of how it worked in Iraq. And we saw what happened when we listened to the Sunni group. I was there during the Iraq surge, the Sons of Iraq, the, uh, the, the awakening, or whatever we called it. And I saw violence drop from in my regiment's area of operations. We had um, uh, over 100, con uh, over what we call ticks, troops in contact. We had uh, over 100 ticks a day. Uh, in our regiment's area of operations. And when within a week or two, it dropped to less than 10 because we had answered to Sunni grievances. A lot of it was, please don't let this Baghdad government prey on us. Um, and we just, even with that knowledge, that that's how that worked in, in, in Iraq. And of course, that was only temporary how, how long it worked. But um, with that knowledge, we still pursued the same strategy in Afghanistan. And to Danny's point about people not knowing anything, um, there was the, the same numbers would get repeated. So if you asked a, a, a general, if you asked an Afghan official, if you asked people in Washington, D.C., what percent of the Afghan army is Pashtun? They will say 40 percent. I was in a meeting with the set with the chair of the, with the um, uh, senior staff 
uh, the, the senior staff member of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And one of his people, when I brought this up, she said, no, he's wrong. The Pashtuns make up 40 percent of the Afghan army. Turns out, as we now know, the Pashtuns never made up more than 3 percent of the Afghan army. So things like this will just get repeated where someone who just literally came out of Afghanistan, who was saying these things, who, who had this experience, is told in a meeting in Washington, D.C. by somebody who's looking at her Blackberry the entire time that, no, he's wrong. It's 40 percent. It's like that type of, 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 again, we're getting back to how the United States government and military and structured and how the incentive is to go along with the narrative for your own personal institutional gain. Then, uh, you know, even try to attempt to understand the reality of what's there. Danny, so the argument now against withdrawal um, from pundits in the Beltway is that w one of them is, is that we're abandoning the gains that the U.S. made for women in Afghanistan. How do you respond to that? You know, I take that seriously in the sense that I do think that we have, you know, some sort of obligation. People work for us. Uh, I take it seriously from an, uh, an empathetic and like ethical standpoint. I mean, just personally, there were some women in urban centers who were better off. There were some, you know, Democrats, you know, sort of like, you know, liberals in the classic sense. Um, what I question is really two things. One, uh, and this seems important. I reject the idea that the United States could meaningfully alter their society in the long term, that any of the gains uh, could have been sustained long term, so long as the kind of underpinning corruption of the whole enterprise and hopelessness of it. Um, only an American exceptionalist country, right? All, I mean, and that's that's almost like clinically insane behavior to even say that, right? If a human being says that I'm, ex I'm an exceptionalist, I mean, I'm, I'm a responsible person. I mean, I'm the arsenal of good in the world. I mean, if they if they said that, if I'm the last best hope for my family and this town, um, you would you put that person away. But when a country does well, it's just patriotism, it's just Americanism. Get on board, chief. Yeah. But the thing is, that's not why we went in, in the first place. So first of all, our goals were were, were out, out outsized. You know, the Afghan study group says, well, keep four thousand there. Actually, it'd be even better if you put eight thousand there. And also, we all work for Raytheon and Lockheed, but which is true essentially. Um, Someone needs to explain what 8,000 soldiers could do that 100,000 couldn't. Um, and and it, the, the thing is, they can stave off total defeat. But this this was an unsustainable enterprise. And then the second one is they just don't know anything about history or motives. You know, and some of them do know and they're evil and they're dissembling. And, and some of them really just don't pay attention all that much, despite having a column with The Washington Post, uh, a regular one. I mean, if you look at the American history in Afghanistan, it is exceedingly clear that this was never about human rights. And there's really uh, three periods to look at. See, when folks talk about this, they get to decide where they start the clock. That's yeah. what the elites get to do in Washington. You know, sequence and star point matters when you make an argument. And, and I think that they're just really disingenuous. If you start last week, you can say, look what these horrible things that are happening to like the women and the people who are clinging to the planes. See, America was doing good in the world in Afghanistan. If you start in 1979 and you look at the period from 79 to 89, when the United States is backing the Mujahideen in order to give the Soviets, quote, their Vietnam, uh, when we actually start funding those elements uh, before the Soviets come in in order to try to goad them in, which that came out sort of later, um, and the elements that we were backing, look, I did not, I wouldn't support a Soviet invasion anywhere. I just don't like invasions. I'm just kind of like, I'm with the Nuremberg principles on that one, like, which I feel really good about. I feel confident in their company. But obviously the United States doesn't. But with the Soviet Union, it's, it's not that they, you know, should have invaded, should have occupied. But the point is we backed a lot of the most reactionary Islamist elements that later coalesced into things that are like the Taliban. And then some of them actually do end up in the Taliban. They weren't so great on women's rights. I mean, there are accounts of CIA officers being there when like executions were happening and rapes and, and all kinds of stuff. We were dealing with some dirty folks. And then if we really cared so much about women, especially in human rights, I heard that from like 98 to 2001, there were lots of executions by the Taliban. I mean, it was absolutely brutal. And before September 11th, I mean, on September 10th, the Taliban was awful to women. You know, and it was really hard to be like a liberal or a homosexual or anything like that in Afghanistan. I didn't see any calls for invasion. You know, I, we didn't do that on human rights. And then finally, once we do go in and even when we move the goalposts and say, actually, we're going to do a little nation building. The reason we're here isn't because we forget about bin Laden. He's not important, even though I said we weren't going to get him dead or alive three months ago. 
He's not important. What we're really here for, so they did the same thing in Iraq, is to make this a better place, to su support the Democrats, support human rights. But even then, just at my level, the people we were working with, the, the local Afghans who were working for the Kabul government, they were only a little bit better, if at all, than the Taliban on those same human rights issues. Um, the captain who was attached to me, the, my counterpart, uh, Afghan army, uh, he abused his own soldiers and prisoners, uh, caught him in the act. Um, the one time I was walking through a poppy field, the biggest, the most beautiful one I've ever seen, massive opium field. Uh, I made a comment to the elder next to me who was also talking to the Taliban, I'm certain, although he was a pretty benevolent uh, two timer. And I don't blame him. But what what, he, what I said to him was, I better tell the colonel about this one because I don't know what the policy is right now. You know, it's changed from time. Should I burn it? But I'll at least report it. And he said he through the interpreter, he laughed with his belly at me. And he said, you can't burn this field. This is Shafi Khan's opium field. Who Shafi Khan? He was the police captain from my district that my colonel took pictures with and took with him everywhere. That was his partner. And then also there was the child rape culture, which I you know, witnessed. And, and essentially the policy of the U.S. government uh, or the U.S. military was don't say anything about that rape stuff. Don't say anything about the child buggery, because if you do, you'll alienate the elders tactically. So that none of that sounds exactly like the motive was human rights. We were there to fight a war. We were we were there to, to invade, conquer, occupy and uh, and pacify. So I just think it's just totally disingenuous. And I get pretty hyped up when I see those arguments, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. If I can add in, um, I mean, to give to give uh, some details to what Danny is saying. Um, and and I, I think this shows the corruption, the corruption of a lot of human rights organizations, a lot of conflict groups, um, you know, the unwillingness to criticize the United States because they receive money from the United States government. I mean, I had this aha moment in 2013 when I was interviewing with the, the uh, with Mercy Corps, which is an international conflict group and having a discussion with them about the war in Syria and their insistence that the rebels in Syria had nothing to do with the jihadists and that the United States had nothing to do with any jihadists and that this was simply a popular uprising, a revolution, a popular revolution against Assad on and on and on. You know, I mean, no, anything that um, could, could potentially label the United States as having anything other than, than benevolent intentions could not be spoken among these groups because so much of their funding comes either from the U.S. government or from corporations, uh, defense corporations, uh, fossil fuel corporations, banks, et cetera, that, you know, want these wars to continue. Um, you know, but to give you an idea. It, it, so where have these groups been these last two decades when under the government, uh, four out of five women, as many as four out of five women are forcibly married, many of them as child brides, where uh, men can legally rape their wives, where the majority of women who are in Afghan prisons are not in those prisons because of moral crime, or because of supporting the Taliban, but because of moral crimes. And just to make sure everyone understands what moral crimes means, moral crimes means that if you are a woman and you are raped, you are the one put in jail. That is the reality of the Afghan government that we have kept in power, that we kept in power in, in, you know, and, and supported up until this past week. You know, and so the, the notion that Danny said that so much of our discussion starts on a select date and that is able to exclude all the antecedents that lead us to this date, as well as to what was actually occurring there. The drugs are a great a great point Danny makes about the drugs. Look, you still hear it. The Washington Post, the New York Times, they would run profiles on various Afghan drug lords um, who were controlling the drug trade, who were part of the Afghan government, whether it be uh, uh, Marshal Fahim, Mohammed Adenor, Golag Shurzai, Ahmed Walid Karzai, um, Ahmed Zada, I mean, all the, right? And then in the same, the next day, run an article about how the Taliban controls the drug trade. I mean, so the media was just as complicit in going along with these things. But, you know, when I was there, the governor of Kandahar was the president's brother, and he was the largest drug lord in Afghanistan. Mohammed Aminur, who just fled Afghanistan a, a week or so ago, was the largest drug lord in northern Afghanistan, and he was on our payroll. Golar Gashurzai was the biggest drug lord in the east, governor of Nangahar province, and on our payroll. You know, Akinzada, this, this uh, be a, like a wannabe BFF with Hamid Karzai, New York Times reporter goes into their house, opens the wrong door, and finds like 20 tons of heroin there. Biggest drug lord in Helmand province, where hundreds of Americans and British soldiers and Marines died, supposedly to stamp out the drug trade. 
drug trade is actually run by our allies in Afghanistan. So the reporting, the discussion on this, the information being provided, you know, it, it just it just further by its absence, by correctly identifying who these people were in Afghanistan, that just allowed this war to continue, uh, you know, for us to continue to build this house of cards higher, basically. So in terms of some of the culprits in the armed forces, uh, we, we've talked about the role of of Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Obama, but in terms of the military, let me ask you to talk about some of the people who devised these doom strategies, starting with uh, General David Petraeus, the former head of the CIA, who for a time commanded uh, U.S. forces in Afghanistan and devised the uh, the so-called uh, surge under Obama. Danny, what did Petraeus uh, oversee and how bad was it? You know, I had the privilege or quite the opposite of being under Petraeus' command in both surges uh, in kind of the cent- one of the central uh, areas in the country that was the focus of both surges, you know, is in Baghdad when he took over. So in both cases, I would get there, you know, and you kind of like be under one commander and then Petraeus would come in. He's going to be the salvation. Uh, I, I really do think that the guy was one of the most uh, politically astute uh, snake oil salesmen ever. I mean, the idea was, you know, I have a PhD and I'm a bit of a better public speaker. And I know how to polish things up and I'm more comfortable in Washington than anywhere else. And I've got this new strategy. In fact, I wrote it. I'm the author of it. So then, you know, he goes to Iraq and he's able to show these short term gains. Now, we know how that turned out. We left behind an unsustainable Shia chauvinist government that alienated the Sunnis and ensured that there would be a new resistance and then shot down the protesters when it started to be peaceful. And then there's a new rising. And but he was he was he was able to leave and go on to the next position as the CENTCOM commander, essentially a bump up to be in charge of both wars before that got called in, before ISIS called in the chips like the Taliban has now. So he, he's a he's a hot figure. And people forget that in like 2011, when I was in Afghanistan and Petraeus was there um, and we'll get to that in a sec. He was looked at as like a presidential hopeful. Mm-hmm. Some people think that Obama gave him the CIA to kind of like keep him out of the 2012 election. Uh, for the, you know, for the, mid, you know, the midway through for his second tour or his second term. So he he sells a bill of goods on Iraq and it's like this was success. Now, McChrystal, who's one of his like sort of protégés, he's also a counterinsurgency guy. You know, he says he's going to do the Afghan war different. He'll be able to do it better, a little more politely. We'll kill less civilians. Of course, it was terribly dirty and messy and, and his formula wasn't going to work either. But after his scandal with Rolling Stone, Petraeus gets put back in charge. And by all accounts, Petraeus didn't really want the job because it's slightly a demotion. And now he's got to recreate the magic trick that wasn't even real. He's got to recreate the illusion. It can be difficult. And so he even said to some folks at the time, like, "Uh, Afghanistan's going to be a pretty tough nut to crack. And they were like, but aren't you a magician on on this stuff? And he's like, all right, I'll give it a shot. But he was way more like sober and circumspect on Afghanistan. And he was not able to produce the, the magic, the numbers even with all the massaging that they did. But he got out of there a little quicker. And what he did then was he cast blame. And he started casting blame before he left. He preemptively said, you know what the problem here is, is this timeline. Obama's not giving us enough time. How am I supposed to do this? But what he really lacked was the joker. He He had that one trump card in Iraq. What he could do was buy off the Sunnis in the short term, have an Ambar awakening, which really started before Petraeus got there. My old boss, uh, one of the great officers still in the U.S. Army, uh, was part of that in, two, in 2006. They were turning the, the tribes, you know, in the first armor division, they were doing that. Um, Petraeus comes in. He's like, yeah, we'll do more of that. And then I'll take all the credit for it. Uh, Petraeus didn't really have that option in Afghanistan because it didn't have that same kind of divide within the Pashtun community, which is where, you know, the mass Taliban sort of strength was. So he'd only stayed for a bit and then. He kind of, you know, turned it over to, I guess it was Alan or whomever at that point. And he then got in his own trouble. But the thing about Petraeus is he's a dangerous man. Four-star generals are very dangerous. They've been dangerous since MacArthur. They were dangerous when Washington didn't really want a standing army despite being like a standing soldier in a way. Um, He is always going to trump the ambassador. Matt, please jump on this in a second. Like, that's absolutely correct. Right. The State Department is supposed to be the lead guy, the ambassador. But I'm sorry, like in a in a in it's still chauvinist American culture, right? There's still militaristic culture. The guy with all the medals that wears them perfectly, 
who can straighten his shoulders, even if he's not a big guy and just has that aura and that confidence of yelling at people and ordering them around and having them just like infantilize themselves in a way around you for 30 years, like sycophants, that person carries a lot of weight culturally, but he also has all the money and the resources as long as the state, state department's kind of underfunded. So I think he's a dangerous man because he can speak intelligently uh, and he carries that aura. But he never, you know, he sold us a bill of goods. He's a big, big culprit of moving the ball to the next general, the next general. And guys like him helped to create this forever war. And they still won't apologize for it. And they say we need more. That's grotesque. Matt, Matt am I right? And maybe I'm recording this wrong or think of someone else. But was Petraeus involved in a public smear effort against you after you came out against the Afghan war? Yes. And and, and unfortunately, I have to, uh, uh, this has to be my final comment, um, uh, but yes, uh, I um, I think I took them by surprise with the amount of coverage. I was on this day show for Reed Zakaria, PBS NewsHour. I, uh, you know, I was on um, I was on television so much that MSNBC kept my own makeup shade in the makeup room, right? Because I was on it once or twice or three times a week. And um, after a few weeks, though, um, of this, I started hearing from producers and bookers being told. Um, look, we're getting this from the strategic communications firm that represents Central Command, uh, saying that you're lying about who you are, you really didn't have any experience, that this was all one big plan for you to become a celebrity anti-war activist. That's the whole reason you went. I mean, they would say these kinds of things, right? Um, they would set up a fake Wikipedia page about me, um, you know, and then they got to the point where um, they were threatening the networks, threatening the, the, the newspapers. Uh, one example, Dan Rather brought me up to New York City. This was back when Dan Rather used to have his hour long show on whatever cable channel that was. And uh, I spent three hours filming with Dan Rather. And while we're doing our B-roll walking around Manhattan, uh, Dan Rather says to me, you know, I know you're right about Afghanistan because I've been going there for three decades and you are exactly right. Right before I leave, his producer comes up to me and says, hey, I just got this message. How do you think I should respond to it? Uh, saying, Matthew Ho is not who he says he is. He was not, you know, on and on and on. And it basically says, if this is the type of people that you want to work with, we do not think we should be working with you. And about three or four weeks later, that episode of Dan Rather Reports or whatever it was called airs, and I am nowhere to be seen in it. But who is, but Dan Rather, of course, is talking to generals. He's visiting Afghanistan, you know, so yeah, absolutely. There, there was that. And to top it all off, to make it is to show you the, the chutzpah, the hubris, the arrogance that goes into these people, both civilian and military. I'm standing at a Christmas party at the Army Navy Club in Washington, D.C. in December 2009. This man walks up to me and he's introducing himself and he says, hi, my name is Duncan Boothby. Um, and if people are familiar with the Michael, Michael uh, uh, Hastings, General McChrystal Rolling Stone story, you'll recognize that name Duncan Boothby. Um, but Duncan Boothby says to me, I just want to introduce myself because I'm the person who's been miscrediting, who's been discrediting you to uh, the U.S. press. I mean, that's the level of arrogance, you know, chutzpah, right, that these people have. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. But that's part of that's part of manufacturing consent. And then, you know, and then I, I lost interviews because of that or things would happen. Like uh, I would go on CNN. And I was told that we can't you have you on by yourself. We have to have someone else to balance you because you, you're portrayed as being biased. And who do they bring on? They one time they brought on Michael O'Hanlon, who if people remember Michael O'Hanlon at the Brookings Institute, has an actual real friendship, personal relationship with General Petraeus. Well, well established about that. He has been voluminous in his writings and defense and cheerleading for these wars, almost always wrong or wrong all the time. And more importantly, his organization takes millions and millions of dollars from the U.S. Defense Department, from the U.S. State Department, from the intelligence community as well as from the banks, the fossil fuel industry, the defense corporations. But according to the producers at CNN, he was a balanced, neutral, authoritative source that they needed, ha needed to have on to balance me. Uh, but unfortunately, Aaron, I have to, to take off. Uh, yeah, Matt, thank you so much. I'll, I'll yeah. let you go. I really appreciate your time. And Danny, if you uh, want to give us any final words as we wrap. Thanks so much, what people, Thank you, Matt. What people should be thinking about as... Um, as this as this fallout unfolds, as the Taliban retakes Afghanistan, now there's this panic about getting out people who help the U.S., getting out people who want to flee Taliban rule. How people should be thinking about this Afghanistan situation in the in, in the coming weeks and months? You know, I, I think the the first way is 
genuine empathy for the fact that the, the real victims here are sort of the Afghan people. Um, you know, they, we, we made a big bet and we lost. And that bet was we didn't have the funds. You know, we took the taxpayer dollars we didn't have. We put them on the credit card. But, you know, the Afghan people were like the unconsulted co-signers. And, and they're still kind of paying for this. So I'm taking seriously uh, efforts to, to change our policies for the future. Some of it's almost too late. But changing our policies for the future so that people's lives aren't a bureaucratic mess. I mean, I'm, I'm working with an interpreter right now. Um, I'm not going to say where in Afghanistan, right? They work with me that is really seriously worried, right? So there's that element of it. There's the human element. I do take that seriously. It doesn't mean I think that military force uh, should have stayed in place or that this wasn't inevitable. I think it basically was. But I hope people will take a bigger look. Let's zoom out. Let's. I would hope the American people would pay a little bit of attention to the foreign policy that's going on. They're lied to. Stuff's made secretive. It's very difficult. Life is hard, right? If you're not a soldier or a state farm person, it can be hard for it to be serious without a draft. But this is a time for collective humility and like self-awareness and self-assessment. Um, and I think that we have to recognize that the, the, I think the big story is the, the self-delusion, which is the most vicious of all that underpin this entire enterprise. There's a lot of little Afghanistans that are still going on right now. And there's going to be future Afghanistans that may go on again. And uh, my son turns 13, you know, this next month. He was three when I was in Afghanistan. I'm looking at a picture of him right now where he does not recognize me when I'm holding him at the ceremony. Um, and the idea that we could do this again, just like we did after Vietnam by doing Afghanistan, that keeps me up at night. And I hope it should keep most American parents up at night. So let's pay attention and let's do a collective self-assessment instead of honing in on the details and making it political.